let's get started. Last session, we stopped here with the two time scale update rule. So we covered it. And we said that there is actually a theory behind having two update rules, one for the discriminator and one for the generator. Basically, you have two learning rates. We had a nice observation that the ADAM optimizer, you can think of it as giving you the dynamics of a heavy ball with friction. And that's the reason it is able to jump over some of these local minima. But the most important part was the fresh inception distance. And uh, as the name suggests, you have the inception model, which is gonna take you from the space of images to the space of codes. So it's gonna take you to RD, for instance, and D is a dimension. It's gonna take an image and it's gonna give you a vector. And now on those vectors, you can work with polynomials. And if you work with the polynomials of first order and second order, those are gonna give you first and second moments, which are gonna to correspond to, to some Gaussian distribution. Now you're gonna put two Gaussians on the real data and on the generated data and measure the distance between the two. And the distance that you see here is exactly the definition of the fresh distance. So unlike the inception score, that was a score, the higher was better, the fresher inception distance is a distance. So the lower is better. As you can see, the lower is giving you the better model. Any questions about this paper? So now you have two methods for measuring the quality of generated images. Okay, I think one of you had a question. Yeah, I was just gonna ask about um, this. So I, I understand up to where we just use um, X and X squared as our polynomials. And then I'm a little confused about like how M is defined in C in some of these things. Okay, so you have a data set of generated images. You have a data set of real images. You can take all of those images, push them through your inception model, and that's gonna give you a bunch of vectors, okay? In the X domain now. This is not the image domain, this is the X domain. These are after being pushed through your inception model. Now you have a data set of uh, real examples, a data set of generated examples in RD. So these are the vector representations of them. You can take the mean and a standard deviation for each of these two sets. So you have a set of real examples, a set of generated examples. The real ones are gonna have MR and CR and uh, the generated ones are gonna have the mean of mg and cg. This is a vector of the same size as x, which is just averaging out those data that you just generated, and c is a matrix. Does that answer your question? Yep, that answers my question, thank you. And then you can now compare the distance between the two. Okay, now we can move on to the next one. The next one is also a theoretical paper. We know that for Wasserstein GAN, we needed our critic to belong to the space of one Lipschitz continuous functions for Wasserstein GAN to work. And we had two ways of doing it. One was clipping the weights. The other one was the gradient penalty. This is a third way of doing that. This is the third way of making your functions Lipschitz. That's good. Actually, if you go back to the original GANs as well, and you study its objective function, you're gonna see that you're gonna need uh, such a condition or such a condition is gonna help you, Lipschitz continuity. Let's see why. This is the original GANs objective function, generated images, real images, and then you're discriminating between the two. And we know that our optimal discriminator is gonna look something like this. It's P data divided by P data plus PG. If you fix PG, that's how, if you fix your generator, that's the optimal discriminator. And we know that there is a softmax going on for DG. Let's just write it down. So DG is soft is the sorry is the sigmoid of something of some function. Now let's go ahead and solve for f star. So DG star of x is equal to sigmoid of f star, and this has to be equal to p of data divided by p of data plus p of g. Sigmoid has exponential in it, and then you can take the log and then solve for f star. So this one I'm gonna leave as an exercise. It's a very easy exercise. 
but then it's going to give you f star is the log of p of data minus log of p of g. So if you solve for f star, that's what you're going to get. This is the optimal f star before the sigmoid. Okay, perfect. Now let's take the derivative of this guy and see what happens. Because the derivatives we are going to need for uh, our optimization. Let's take the derivative with respect to x of a star. Because of this log term, you're going to have 1 over p data times the gradient of p data. Same thing here, 1 over pg times the gradient of pg. Now pg could become close to 0 for some, for some points uh, or actually 0. So it could vanish. It means that this term is becoming infinity. Or even you cannot compute it if you are dividing by 0. So this term can become unbounded because you have a lot of flexibility here. Okay, And that's exactly because of the sigmoid and taking the log. So what we are going to say is that we want to avoid this guy becoming unbounded or incomputable. How? We can say that if this guy is Lipschitz continuous, then you're going to have a Lipschitz constant. So it's not going to let it become unbounded. So we are somehow regularizing f star. So even Lipschitz continuity is going to help the original GANS objective function. So now you're going to do an argmax of v of g and d over the family of Lipschitz continuous functions. So now your d is a little bit regularized. So does this make sense so far? That makes sense. OK, perfect. So now let's go ahead and try to make things Lipschitz, make neural networks Lipschitz continuous. The idea is a spectral normalization, as the name of the paper suggests. But how can we do that? These are neural networks, and they are composition of functions. And actually, the name deep neural networks is because you have compositions of functions. So you are composing functions. Let's take one layer. It has h in. That's your input. And then it's going to give you an output vector. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the definition of the Lipschitz constant for this particular function, g. You can compute the spectral norm of the gradient of g. And remember, gradient of g, the gradient depends on where you are taking derivatives. So if you change h, you're going to have a different gradient. And each one of them is going to have a spectral norm. And I'm going to tell you what is a spectral norm. This is just the L2 norm of these matrices. And then you are going to take a supremum over all of these h, because the gradient depends on where you are taking the derivative. That's going to give you the Lipschitz constant, or the Lipschitz norm. What is the spectral norm? The norm of a matrix, you can define it in terms of the norm of vectors. So you take a multiplied by a vector. Now a times h is a vector. And you can have the L2 norm of that. And then you can normalize it by the norm of that vector. So you're going to divide it by that. That's going to give you the definition of the norm of A. And that's actually the definition of a spectral norm. And this has to be not equal to 0, because if it is 0, then you're dividing by 0 and you are in trouble. And some simple mathematics, because you can now take this norm of H2 and put it inside the other norm. Now you can assume that you are normalizing your h's. It means that you are working with h, all of the vectors whose norm is less than 1. So you can either work with this definition or the other definition. But this is just uh, if you took a linear algebra course, and that's the prerequisite for this course, this is a standard def definition for a spectral norm. OK, perfect. Now let's go ahead and write down the neural network. What are we going to have? x is going to go in. You're going to multiply it by a weight. And let's forget about biases for now. And then you can do an activation on that. So this is a nonlinear function like ReLU. You take the outcome, multiply it by W2. You do another nonlinearity, and then you keep doing that. And then a linear layer at the end. So this is a neural network, a bunch of functions, function compositions. Now let's write down the Lipschitz norm of that. The Lipschitz norm of f, there is a function that is taking you from the hidden state L to the next hidden state by multiplying by a matrix. This is this guy. And we are renaming everything here to be HL. Then you are going to have the norm of your activation function. Then you're going to have a function, a linear function, that is taking you from HL minus 1 to HL by 
multiplying by WL. That's your the norm Lipschitz, and then you can do it, do that all the way around. And uh, there are some properties that I'm using for this inequality. I'm using this property. So if you have the composition of two functions, their Lipschitz norm is the product of the Lipschitz norm of those two functions. So that is what you're using for this inequality. And these are the function compositions. Now they are turning into products. So far, so good. Now for this equality, why are we getting rid of the Lipschitz norm of these activation functions? Because for ReLU and leaky ReLU, their Lipschitz norm is one. So you can just drop them, perfect. Now you're only left with these linear functions and that's gonna give you the product of the spectral norm of these Ws, of your weights. So far, so good. Now, what can you do? You have a problem here. This is not gonna be one or it's not gonna be bounded because you can have different WLs. What you can do is you can normalize. You can define a new set of parameters W hat spectral normalized, which is a function of your original Ws, and you're just dividing by sigma W. Now the spectral norm of this is going to be one because it's going to be the spectral norm of W divided by the spectral norm of W, which is one. So if you normalize your weight, you're going to be able to control the Lipschitz norm of your neural network. Awesome. Any questions so far? Do we not worry about singular matrices because we initialize with random data for W and so we're not gonna, we, it's gonna be impossible to end up with a, a singular W? So yes, your question is this guy could become zero, but then uh, the probability of that happening is very low because you're initializing, as you said, your weights randomly. Yeah. Okay, the probability of that phenomena happening is very low. It's basically zero. It's never going to happen. Any other questions? Okay, this is theory, but how are we going to do it in practice? Computing the spectral norm is not easy. Okay, this is nice. This is a nice theory, but the cool thing is that linear algebra is going to come to our rescue now. How? You can use the power iteration method to compute these sigma w's on the fly. So remember, for each layer, you have a bunch of weights and uh, you need to compute sigma w for each layer. So what are we gonna do? Initially during training, in addition to your parameters of your neural network, you're gonna introduce some other parameters. So u tilde, and you initialize them randomly, okay? So you initialize these guys randomly. And per each layer, you're gonna have u tilde. So this u tilde is, for, is a function of the layer that you're at. So for each layer, you're going to have some extra parameters, UL, some extra vectors. You multiply by W transpose, divide by the norm. That's going to give you V tilde. You take V tilde, you multiply by W, divide by the norm. That's going to give you your updated U tilde. And then you keep repeating that. While optimizing for W, you can keep updating U tilde. So U tilde, you are not optimizing over it. You are just using this iteration. Why is it useful? Because then you can compute sigma w pretty easily. Now you have u tilde, you have w, you have v tilde, you multiply them together. That's gonna give you the norm of that matrix. And this is just power iteration method, but you're doing it while training. So initially your u tilde and v tilde are gonna be really bad, but once the training is done, towards the end of the training, these guys are gonna be in good location. And, they're, and if they are in good location, they are going to give you correct uh, spectral norms. So is everything clear? I just have one question. Sure. Um, so the, the spectral norm is the max singular value. Um, and is this power iteration like modified so that it finds the max singular value and not the max eigenvalue? Yes, it is actually doing that. So it's going to give you the maximum. It's going to give you the norm of this matrix. Okay. Okay, here we need to know our linear algebra. So what is the spectral norm, the definition of a Lipschitz uh, norm, and uh, the power iteration. But assuming that we know our linear algebra, then computing this guy is not hard. There is an algorithm for that, okay? So this is smart. In terms of the loss function, what are we gonna use? 
So far, we learned a bunch of a family of loss functions that we could use. One was the original loss function. One was the Wasserisch triangle loss function, least squares loss function. Here's another one, the hinge loss. What is the hinge loss telling us? Let's forget about this one. So this is the definition of a hinge loss. Let's forget about this one for a second and let's change our labels. Previously, our labels were zero or one. You can have your labels to be negative one or one. This is the ground truth. So each data is going to have its own label. And then our model is going to do some prediction. Sometimes the predictions of the model are positive. Sometimes the predictions of the model is negative. Let's say the prediction is positive and the ground truth is one. You are multiplying one by a positive number. That's going to give you a positive number. You multiply by a negative sign. That's a negative number. And the maximum of zero and negative is, neg is zero. So you're never going to update your parameters. So it means that you are not penalizing. Your model is doing correct. And in the other case, if the ground truth is negative one and your model is correctly predicting y to be negative, you multiply two negative numbers together. That's going to give you a positive number. You make that negative by this negative sign. The maximum of zero and the negative number is zero. So you're not going to penalize your model. So your model is doing the correct thing. But as soon as it does the wrong prediction, if your underlying truth is one and your model is predicting negative, then that's going to be a negative number. You multiply by a negative, it's going to give you a positive. Maximum of zero and a positive number is going to be the positive one. So you're going to penalize your model. That's your objective function. But then not only you want it to happen uh, for that particular case, you want it to happen with some margin. You want your model to be correct by a margin. You don't want it to be at the boundary, which is zero. You want it to be correct by a margin. So visually speaking, this is your loss function. Whenever the multiplication of the prediction of the model and the ground truth is bigger than one, you're not going to penalize. Otherwise, you're going to keep penalizing your model. And the rest of the objective here are for you to see the landscape of the type of objective functions that you can use. One of them is the zero one loss. As soon as it is positive, you're OK. As soon as it becomes negative, penalized by a constant, that's going to give you zero one loss. The blue line is the hinge loss. The cross entropy loss is trying to approximate this hinge loss. This is what you were using for the original GAN. And then you can have exponential loss and all sorts of other losses. And you're going to use hinge loss in your, uh, for your discriminator and the generator. Okay, for the data that are actually data, you're doing the correct thing. The underlying label is one. So T is one here. And then remember, this is a minimum, that's a maximum. So you are multiplying by negative to give you the, to give you the minimum here. That's why this one is turned into a negative one. And there was a negative sign here, which is now a positive. And for the data that are being, that are coming from your generator, you have a label that is negative one. And that's where this negative is coming in. And the generator loss is just a function of this loss. So you're just going to drop this negative and this is going to turn into a positive. It's trying to fool the discriminator. And in terms of numbers, how things are going to work, this A, B, C, D, E, and F are different configurations for your learning rate, the parameters of the uh, Adam optimizer, and then this is the number of iterations that you're going to use for your discriminator. So these are different hyperparameters that you choose. And these are going to give you these colors here. As you can see, this is weight clip. This is more sensitive to the choice of your hyperparameters. GANs with gradient penalty. Wasserist triangle GAN with gradient penalty. Batch norm, layer norm, weight norm, orthonormal. There is a penalty on making your weights orthonormal, and this is a spectral norm. So this is less sensitive to the choice of your hyperparameters, and it's giving you better inception score because now you're able to control the Lipschitz constant of your neural network. Is everything clear? Any questions before I move on?